Great. So if you're just, here we go. Is anybody watching? I don't know. I'm not sure actually if there's anyone in here now. But it'll be recorded. Have, so it'll be recorded. Yeah, people can. Future, that'll be an option. Yeah, yeah. Um, so but I should look at you rather than at the computer. Yeah, you should look at me. Okay. You yeah. Got it. Um, so what brings you to Biofo? Uh, I'm going to be talking to uh, people. I'm part of the the outside speaker series. Mm -hmm. um, there's an inside speaker series, which is for people who are from UCSF. Stanford or UC Berkeley. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's true, yeah. I'm not from that. I'm from the outside speaker series of the people who are not from any of those institutions. Yeah. And um, I guess well, you're talking later today, so I don't want to really give away the talk yet because I still want to be surprised. Um, but uh, what um, what makes you excited about BioHub? Well, I, I'm very interested in science. And what I realized is sort of every fact that I know about science is wrong. Okay. And every noun that I've learned about science, organism, cell, protein, gene, evolution, is just a box full of a thousand questions that I don't know the answer to. So to me, it's very exciting to kind of learn the level of my ignorance. Um, and just realizes all this, you know, evolution. But what is evolution? Genetics. But what's genetics? What's a gene? Uh, all that seems super uh, exciting and interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, and so, what? I guess what do you have to gain from coming to me? Because I would say, for me, I learned that those terms are wrong all the time. And the terms that we use at any particular point, like gene or like organism are, yeah, just our, whatever our current understanding is, and we use, and, and the, the people in the room who are using it have all hopefully agreed on what that means, and then can use that concept to then move on and describe the next one, but I don't know, I wouldn't, I would say scientists themselves still um, think, um, still find that terms like that to be ambiguous. Right. So, I'm curious, um, when did you first have an idea that you're still proud of having? Uh, I think uh, one of the, my first scientific experiments was uh, I wanted to see whether sunflower plants would grow faster if I watered them with tea instead of water. Uh -huh. When did you have that idea? Uh, I was probably like seven or eight. Mm -hmm. And, and who, who gave you the idea that you should perform a controlled experiment? Did you invent it yourself? Or did someone um, tell you there was a thing? I think we were doing some kind of science stuff at school. Maybe we were trying, maybe we were trying to grow uh, sunflower plants in general, and we had to grow a few of them to, um, to, as, a, as an experiment itself. Like maybe we had to grow three as part of the school uh, project. So the school I, had taught you the idea of what an experiment with sunflowers was? Maybe. My parents are also mathematicians, so they, they could have influenced me as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I just really wanted to, um, but yeah, I knew that tea, like I wasn't allowed to drink tea at that point, and that, so it was just a controlled substance sure. uh, that I wasn't uh, privy to having, and I just thought that, oh, well, it makes like people like move really fast, right. so maybe it'll help the plants move really fast. and uh, Yeah, so I think that was probably my first experiment. I see. I did. And, and were you happy with it? Uh, well, the results were inconclusive. They grew, okay. grew at the same rate. I think over a week they were I about see. the same. So you were not growing them all the way to sunflower? No, no, no. Was, I didn't have that kind of patience. Yeah. The seedlings. And how about in your, since you were eight, like what's the first idea you have that you still put on your CV? Hmm. Um, I think. It would probably actually be more recent. I think the the scientific ideas that I'm exploring now are the are some of the ones I'm most proud of. Um, so, so what's one of them? One of them is I'm very interested in a, a grand unified theory of cells, is what I call it. So I'm very interested in evolution of cell types across different species and what's what's skin across species, what are blood vessels across species, 
what's uh, something that filters your blood, so liver, kidney, what, are, what do those look like across species? Okay, so here's an example of words that I know that I suspect don't mean anything anymore. <laughs> Homologous and analogous structures. Yeah. Like, when, does your grand unified theory say that a bat wing and a butterfly wing are both wings, or that they're not both wings? Um, I don't know. To me, what defines uh, similar cell types are ones that are um, ones that exhibit similar molecular machines. All right. So if inside each cell, so inside each membrane, there is a uh, similar set of molecular machines, then I am assuming that that means they're performing similar tasks. Um, there could be some mix where it's a similar set of machines, but their their tasks have been reassigned, and I can't detect that. So is, is hemoglobin an example of a machine? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. it is. Yeah. So the, some bugs don't have iron; they have copper. Is that right? That I actually don't know. What what kind of bugs are those? Uh, we've, we've gone out of my area. Of okay. I was yeah, hoping well, to get credit for remembering that there's a yeah. hemoglobin. Um, well, we have a question. Greetings, knowledgeable people. This is um, Shalaku from um, so part of a Twitch streaming group called the Knowledge Fellowship. Hi. So there's a few people that are streaming educational content on Twitch. Like oh, this. so there are children watching? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, so there's people young, watching. Yeah. Young people. Okay, what's the question? Um, just saying hello. Oh, hello. It's not a question so much yeah. as a greeting. Yeah. All right. Uh -oh. so we can move this over. Can have this more on you. Um, so I guess my question was, Assuming that it is true that there's a grasshopper that carries oxygen in its blood using copper mm -hmm. rather than iron, is that the same machine for your purposes? That to me, hmm, that to me would be the same machine. Okay. Because the goal that accomplishes of carrying oxygen is the, is the same. Right. The molecular machine will be slightly different in terms of its sequence, um, but copper and iron. I think iron is a little bit uh, lower on the periodic table, it's a little heavier, but since they're both, um, they both can be positively charged and, and mm -hmm. the machine that holds that iron molecule in there is still going to be similar than if something it was trying to hold something that was negatively charged or was trying to hold something that was, that was neutral or inert, like that would be a completely different structure versus something that's also holding something that's a positive charge. Like it was also holding magnesium or something. Right. Um, that to me, in my definition, is the same. Okay. So your idea was to have a grand unified theory of cells, or you actually have an idea of what the grand unified theory of cells is? I'm trying to understand what that means. That's well, that's well, what well, the project. That's what the project I'm calling means. I'm still in really the benchmarking phase of how can you tell two cells that from different species are similar. And what's your guess? Of how, like, what the percentage similarity between? No, I guess I'm trying to figure out the idea is to come up with a taxonomy of cells. Yeah. And That's an idea. And, and what so far? How, how's it going? How far? How far along are you? I've been working on this for like six months, right. <laughs> so it's pretty early. Um, but it works in the sense that um, taking cells from mice and taking cells from human from the same organ bladder do map to one another. Um, and the advantage of this is that we're not um, explicitly looking for the exact same molecular machine, so the exact same gene as people have previously, which is its own difficult problem. Um, like as chromosomes rearrange and duplicate, there could be the same gene that um, now exists in two lo locations. So there's not a lot of one-to-one, -one, well, there's a good amount of one-to-one -one mapping, but then there's a good amount of like many-to-many, one-to-many mappings from one species to the next, from one person to the next. Either. Right. So what this method does is it ignores the uh, entire gene structure and just looks at pieces of genes. And from that, we're looking at um, essentially the, the similarity of cell, cell types based on these um, pieces of the machine. I, I got lost. You're looking at the genome or you're looking at the cell machines? I'm looking at the uh, machinery that's expressed in individual cells. I see. 
and you're comparing a mouse bladder cell and a human bladder cell. Yep. And what what have you learned so far? Uh, I've learned that they're pretty similar. So uh -huh. I've, I've, I've learned, I've, yeah, I'm not yet advanced enough that I'm able to look at all cells that we have between human and mouse or, or human and another species. Um, but the similarities are there. They're mm -hmm. like the mouse bladder cells are more similar to human bladder cells than they are to like human lung cells. Um, How about mouse lung cells? Mouse lung cells. Um, so one experiment I did was um, looking at human cancer cells, um, can, uh, lung cancer cells, and those were in that experiment very similar to epithelial cells, so surface cells of the large intestine. Huh. Um, so in that case, it's a little harder to say because the um, we know that data set has a lot of surface cells, but is it are they truly more similar to the um, the large intestine? Um, is the lung data set just kind of wacky and like we didn't annotate it so well, or it's not annotated so well, and the uh, large intestine data set is better, um, or is it that the because the data is human lung cancer that we have some normal cells and some cancer cells, and these cancer cells look more like these uh, lung large intestine mm -hmm. cells. I, I don't know yet. I so, don't know. So, um, what is a data set? Uh, a data set, in my case, would be a group of um, cells and their um, their molecular signatures. Okay, so it's not, it's not, I shouldn't view it as like a computer file full of information. It's an actual physical object? Uh, well, in this case, it is a, it is a computer file. Yeah, it, so is a computer it, it is It is a, like one cell is represented by like an identifier, some other metadata, uh, and then a big whole list of um, the, a subset of the molecular machines that are on like a transformation of those molecular machines that let us look at many of them at once without, um, but randomly sample them in a way that we can guarantee that there's some similarity between one cell and the next. Because if we sampled like completely randomly, we'd have very, very unlikely that we could have any sort of overlap. So what we do is we do a randomization and then for each sample we take um, we do a randomization, so tr transform every sequence into a number mm -hmm. um, through an algorithm called hashing. So this is how like, cryptography and Bitcoin and all of that work. Uh, so we transform each molecular or piece of a molecular machine to a number via hashing. Because all those numbers are randomly generated, we can sort them, and then we have a random sorting of our original data set. Why do you want a random sort? Because the full data set is a bit redundant. We don't really need to see every, every, every single piece. Okay. We can subset some of the data and still retain a lot of the relationships okay. that we see. And that, to me, has been the most surprising thing. So say you have, um, so in my experiments, I saw that we have uh, maybe like 5 million um, pieces of molecular machines per cell. Mm -hmm. at, least, at least this kind of human cell. We really only need like 5,000 to tell differences between cells. Maybe 1,000 to tell differences and 5,000 to really say that these are similar. Okay. So that's like one, not even one 1,000. What is it? One? Yeah, one 1,000 of our full data set is. So it's a little bit like if you took a sentence out of a book, you could tell if it was in French or English. Yeah, exactly. The, the, this algorithm actually comes exactly from um, from uh, finding duplicate websites. So oh. it was originally used by uh, Alta Vista for finding duplicate websites, and, which is funny because now I tell people that and, and, and I have to remind them that like I am old enough to know what Alta Vista yeah, is <laughs> and, right. that, and that they may not know, <laughs> right. um, which is kind of funny. And but yeah, to find duplicate websites because it's very unlikely that like yeah, two sentences from um, two different uh, books are the same. Right. right. Or but two you don't need same. to check every sentence. You can 
you can check every hundred seconds and you'll be able to figure out if they do perfect. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Do you want to ask me something? Um, you don't have to. I can keep asking you. Something. Yeah. Um, what, I guess, what has been, um, what has been the most, yeah, it seems like two. What what's been surprising about being a writer? Like when you when you first joined the career and that um, you became a writer, and you were taken by surprise by something that now is totally um, normal to you. Well, I was very surprised by the notion that collaboration could yield good results because hmm. I sort of came into it with the idea that. To be a writer means to have your own unique, distinctive voice. So I thought, well, if two people are collaborating, or ten people are collaborating, that that would lead to a kind of um, averaging out of mm. the quality. And I learned that that's not really the case, that you can, if you sort of get on the same wavelength, get synergistic effects from people collaborating. Mm. That people can figure out what is their strong suit and play to that, but also people can divvy up things and people can learn to copy each other or hone in to sort of triangulate on a way of looking at something or a way of writing in a way that is good. Mm. Um, and that was interesting to me. And I guess I suppose it makes sense because you're never truly writing alone because you're always writing with at least one other person in mind in the audience. You're not really writing for yourself, but it's an act of communication. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense to me that, well, if three people are trying to communicate with three other people, well, those three people could improve their communicative strategy uh, by teaming up. So yeah. in retrospect, it shouldn't have been as surprising as it was, but it was. I think I may have just come into it with some sort of egocentric, romantic notions of like a lone poet or something yeah. like that. Yeah, do you think that's also part of schooling too? That like in school, I mean, you're not allowed to plagiarize or work with other people um, yes. as, as certainly, explicitly. Yeah, certainly nobody ever said in school why don't you guys team up in a group of five and write a story? Mm -hmm. So sure, I do think there's something to be said for that. Uh, I think you could imagine a, a schooling system or a civilization where they tried to teach people uh, cooperation more. Mm. I've heard that it's more cooperative in Finland mm. than it is in the United States. I wouldn't be too surprised. See if we have any questions. Do you have any, do you consider similar structures with average through uh, convergent evolution in your grand unified theory? Um, I think, in, so in my definition, I would say yeah, because... That was uh, what I was going to say. Yeah. If, I assumed it was talking about your grand unified theory, so I let you... Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the only grand unified theory, mm -hmm. if you ask me. Okay. Uh, the, yeah, if, if ultimately the machines are the same and they're functioning... Um, they're producing uh, similar results. That to me, those are the same cell type. I'm not trying to trace. Um, I'm not trying to uh, say that. I'm not trying to say that something can only be accomplished through convergent evolution or for from uh, a common ancestor. To me, if the something was the same across um, multiple species and accomplished the same function, but was arrived at in multiple different ways, I find that. Right, right. And there may be just certain uh, physical constraints on engineering solutions, so mm -hmm. they may tend to, you know, four ways on Earth with our atmosphere to fly. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. Why do you think um, a wheel never evolved? Yeah, we were talking about this at lunch. I think yeah. that's interesting. Um, Somebody claimed, by the way, at lunch that a wheel did evolve because an armadillo can roll into a ball, I find this to be sophistry. <laughs> uh, I think...
there's there's other animals that do um, that do have uh, tools that right. that do create tools. Um, right. The what is it called? The jellyfish makes tools, right? Oh, does it? No, I, don't I, think, I don't know about <laughs> that. Okay. No, like crows. Yeah, chimps, crows make tools. Um, uh, uh, walruses, probably. Yeah. Yeah. But none of them have made cars. They made cars or taxes or... Taxes? <laughs> Do I they even have currency? I, think, I, I, I just think about something of like human, human civilization sometimes. Like I learn about some really complicated uh, way that you manage permissions and roles of, of people who can sign into a compute service and how much they yeah. can access and whatnot. And I just remember walking away from that being like, yeah, like, no, like, no, like, animal, has, other animals come up with something this complicated. This is just very, very complicated. But I do think it, it actually comes back to collaboration, because I think mm -hmm. the, the, from what I've learned, that there are few other organisms that have, as he, compared to humans, have similar like, tool building intellectual capacities, but also collaborative natures that mm -hmm. you don't often see like two chimps like whole like carrying something like carrying like a log together over a stream or right. some other collaborative effort for this like greater good of the organization it's always like a constant fighting of like who's going to be alpha right. and who will be the who will be the best there so i do think the collaboration in what i read was that chimps can learn Mm -hmm. But chimps cannot teach. It's mm -hmm. a notion of a chimp saying, it seems a pretty good way to get termites out of a, a termite mound with a straw, that they'll learn it, but they won't deliberately teach it to other chimps. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes a chimp will watch another chimp doing it and will learn it, but they won't teach it. And that means they kind of don't have cultural evolution. Yeah. That they can copy something, and they'll do that. And there's some really interesting case about some kind of birds mm -hmm. in... England that learned to break open milk when it was delivered and drink the milk. And that behavior would spread, it spread to Germany. Wow. That birds would copy other birds. But there was no bird school yeah. where they would gather the birds together and teach them to do this. And be this. like, all right, to be a successful, successful bird, you just got to find the bird seed yes. at the person's house, steal yes. it. Because, yeah, we have, a, I've seen a, like, uh, squirrels come and steal all the birds who do like climb onto the climb onto the side of the fence of the deck and jump onto the bird feeder and then yeah so do you have an opinion if humans were to exit the globe by either willingly or unwillingly is there another species that would evolve to take our place the one I've thought about um, I read about a bit from um, um, what's the name is? Uh, he wrote, You Are Not a Gadget. Um, his name is. Um, Clean? No. Uh, it, so, it sounds like Lannister, but it's not Lannister. Mm -hmm. uh, I will remember it. Okay. But, um, but he was an early pioneer of a virtual reality. And one of. Lanier, Jared Lanier. Yes, Jared yes. Lanier, yes. And um, from his writings, he, I think, convincingly states that um, that cephalopods, so like octopi, octopus, yes. uh, squids, and, and cuttlefish, I think they are actually quite nicely poised because they have quite a bit of like tool development right, and right. a lot of intellectual capacity. Hi. Hello. Uh, <laughs> How are so you? So not walruses. I don't think walruses, no. Okay. I, my, my money is on octopus. Okay. My other, my actual answer is not walruses. I think it's squirrels. Squirrels, yeah? Yeah. Nice. They're very smart. They're energetic. They've got a kind of gratitude. Yeah. We used to feed a squirrel by our house and then uh, we stopped feeding it. Well, it got really, really fat. Oh, good. Right. <laughs> and then we stopped feeding it and then I saw it the other day. It didn't look so good. Oh, so you think it would have been better not to interfere? Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Eric. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Hi, Twitch Thank people. Thank you, everyone.